so 15 minutes, I got it. Got you covered. Um, okay, so my name's Rory. I'm a PhD student at CU Boulder. I just wanted to mention first that I first started working with MSI in 2004. Um, and so I've been involved with different projects in the area for quite a while. Um, and I've been either a part-time or full-time resident on the other side of the hill in Telluride um, for about 10 years now. So I spent a fair amount of time uh, in the San Juans. And today I'm going to talk about a project um, called the Multiple Tracer Geochemical Approach to Characterizing Water and Contaminant Movement Through Abandoned Mine Workings in Rico, Colorado. Um, this project was in conjunction with Mike Wireman at the US EPA, Mark Williams, who's my advisor at CU Boulder, Rob Runkle in the crowd here from the USGS, and I also want to give a special thanks to Alan Sorensen from DRMS and other DRMS staff folks, as well as uh, a number of con contributions from the MSI staff, as well as Jan Kirstner at URS. Um, so, luckily I don't need to spend very much time on maps or geology, because we've had about five hours of it today. Um, but I'll just point out Southwest Colorado, just for reference, where Rico is. Um, it's, where's my, where's the laser, sorry. There we go. Okay, so Rico um, is on the Dolores River, um, just to the west of here. Um, and I wanted to put on the Colorado Mineral Belt. Rico is kind of near the southern terminus of this mineral belt, if you think about it moving across the state. Um, and this is just kind of a nice picture of mountains in the Rico area. Um, so a little history uh, of the Rico mining district since it's outside of the Silverton Basin. People may not be as familiar. Um, in this area from about 1869 until 1977, it was an active gold, silver, zinc, copper, and lead mines. Uh, there's the production rates. Um, in 1931, there was a, the St. Louis Tunnel was driven in um, to explore for deep ore bodies. Um, and then in the 50s, they actually built a sulfuric acid production plant from the pyrite coming out of the mine. And I just found out from Alan that much of the sulfuric acid was then moved over to Yerevan to help produce uranium. Um, and in the 1950s through 1979, there was a series of ponds constructed as part of this sulfuric acid um, and also for tailings disposal in the mining area. Um, in the 71, the mining company ceased operations and they allowed the deeper workings to flood. Um, and in 80, between 1980 and 83, the Atlantic Richfield Company, known as ARCO, acquired the Rico Argentine mining um, and they conducted some exploration drilling but no actual mining. Um, and to point out in 2000, ARCO became a subsidiary of BP. So today, ARCO falls under BP. Um, and then in 2011, the EPA um, had mandated some cleanup by ARCO under CERC related to CERCLA. So what are the environmental issues here? Um, what you see in this top right picture is the St. Louis Tunnel. Um, and the discharge from the tunnels contains high concentrations of the metals. Um, and their permit lapsed in 2010, where zinc was coming out at about 3,900 micrograms per liter. Um, and this portal discharges to these tailing ponds, which then eventually flow directly into the Dolores River. Um, and these unlined ponds adjacent to the river contain sludge and tailings. Um, and they contain about 65,000 cubic yards. Um, and here's your concentrations of your zinc, cadmium, copper, and lead. Um, and currently, one of the first state phases of these projects is to dredge these ponds, take the tailings out, dry it, and put it into a permanent storage facility. The next question is, how do we deal with this water that's coming out um, and continuing to discharge from the mountain? Um, so, what are the objectives? What are we doing? We want to identify the sources of water that are going into the mine, identify sources and locations of acid mine drainage being generated within the mine complex, and then to also characterize the mine water and flow paths. So how is the water contributing to the St. Louis Tunnel from which areas and in which quantities? How are we gonna do this? We're gonna use geochemical and isotopic analysis, stream tracer studies, and also mine working tracer studies. And why do we wanna do this? We wanna evaluate the feasibility of hydro hydrologic controls to reduce the volume of discharge and or contaminant loads from the St. Louis Tunnel. So a way to think of it is looking at targeted remediation options. Instead of your 
Um, immediate option to just build a treatment plant, treat the water coming out, and that's it. Now we're actually going to work backwards and say, hey, maybe we don't need to deal with all this water. Maybe there's only a portion of this water out of this tunnel that actually is containing the AMD. Can we identify that, those sources? Um, so geology, we've had quite a bit of it. Um, I'll just point out a few things quickly um, on the geologic map here down at the bottom. Um, we had domal uplift um, of Precambrian monzonite, about a 6,000 feet of uplift. Um, and the dome is bounded by numerous near vertical faults. Um, and the one that we're going to focus on where the Rico Argentine mine is the Black Hawk Fault, which is a northeast southwest trending fault um, to the east side of the dome. And associated with this fault, there's a number of reverse and normal faults sub parallel to this major fault. Um, we want to point out, it's been discussed earlier today, the main target areas in here um, in terms of ore bodies have to do with the Pennsylvania Age Hermosa Foundation, which was intruded by the dome um, and widespread and outcrop, subcrop dips away from the dome. And the total thickness is about 2,800 feet. Um, so the ore bodies. Um, that we're here, this is, I'm going to be really quick because we've talked about this quite a bit today. So basically you have mineralization due to hydrothermal fluids moving along the faults. And I just want to point out, um, we can see activity occurring four to 500 feet from either side of the major faults to give you an idea of the impacts of the temperature and pressure changes. Um, the ore deposits are massive sulfide replacement uh, deposits in the limestones of the Hermosa Foundation. Um, and in this situation, many of the ores were mined by stoping lime limestone blocks. And because the way the faulting occurred, a lot of them were in a downdrift direction, which resulted, as you'll see later, in a lot of connections between different levels of the mine. So you can imagine stoping in down directions, you're going to end up connecting different layers depending on how far you go, which plays into the hydrologic connections down the road. Um, so here's an overview of the, of the mining system. This is the town of Rico. This is the Dolores River. This is also Colorado Highway 145. You can actually see the treatment ponds from this aerial photo. Here's the St. Louis Tunnel, which connects to the Southeast Crosscut. And this is the Rico Argentine mine complex. For scale, this, this tunnel here is about 8,000 feet in distance. Um, and so we're draining water from this complex out to the, near the level of the, um, the Dolores River. Uh, here's a close-up, so now we're zoomed in, still aerial photo, overlooking the Argentine mine. Here's some of the remaining buildings. Here's most of the tailings that were associated with it, and then Silver Creek. Um, as I showed you in the geologic photo, I just threw in, here's the approximate location of that Black Hawk Fault underground that they're the target areas. And the two tunnel portals we were entrancing for underground work were the Argentine at it and the Blaine Tunnel, uh, which are both on either side of Silver Creek. The sampling points along Silver Creek, uh, just to give you an idea of some spatial profiles we were doing with surface water studies. Um, now we're going to turn and look inside the mine, so you can kind of get a vertical view of what we're talking about. Um, once again, this is Silver Creek on the surface. Here's our at entries that we went into to get to the different shafts. Um, and then these are the associated levels that we're working with. Um, and we know that they go down at least to the 700 level. Approximately speaking, we're talking about 100 feet between levels. The key point here is this 500 level is equal to the southeast crosscut, which goes directly to the St. Louis tunnel. Um, and so one of our access points was actually working through this 517 shaft where it was 475 feet to water. Um, and that's currently where the water level is in the mine workings. Um, so just, you know, quickly go through a little, the different points that we're interested in to give you some ideas of what we're talking about. The St. Louis Tunnel, um, here's some measurements we took last year. Um, the pH in the tunnel is actually not too bad. It's between six and seven coming out. Um, and, there, and there are not a ton of metals, but there are certainly some elevated levels that we need to be concerned with. Um, and when we're talking about quantification of this, you want to think about it in terms of how much water we have coming out. Um, what I've plotted here um, in the blue is the discharge from the St. Louis Tunnel, uh, and it's in GPM, so we're talking 600 to 900 GPM. And the red is the Dolores River, just to compare it to a surface water. What you notice here, Dolores River, snow melt, pulse dominated hydrograph. There's a lag in the peak of the water coming out of the St. Louis Tunnel, which speaks to groundwater movement. 
Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about Silver Creek. Silver Creek going across the mine areas. What I've just plotted up here is sulfate concentrations um, in June and October. And this is distance downstream across the mine complex. Um, and all I wanted to point out here is that there are some pretty clear areas where you see increases and often you can associate sulfate um, loading with AMD um, sources. And what you can see here is there's some certainly in June during high flows you see steady increases but it's hard to really locate them. But when you get to low flow times you can see these increases become more pronounced and you can start to say well maybe there's some target areas where these increases are happening. And what's interesting is this target area here on the front end is between say 200 and 400 meters downstream. That's the section of the stream that crosses where the mine adits are in the Black Hawk Fault. Um, zinc concentrations along Silver Creek. Um, so here's, um, I put your acute and chronic water quality standards so you can see how during low flows in October, lower flow, you're going to have higher concentrations. Um, and you can see that along all these distances downstream, you start to see an increase. Same as the previous sulfate graph, though, you can see major jumps at certain locations. This one may be associated with the mine workings. Um, within the mine chemistry, uh, this is at the bottom of the 517 shaft. And what I want to point out here is just to give you an idea of concentrations of metals that we're finding within these mine pools underground. Um, and what we can see is that blue is August sampling, and then red and green are October. Red and green, we just sampled at two different depths in the pool to see if there was any difference, no major differences. What you can see is that concentrations do tend to be higher in October than in August, which um, probably has something to do with the water flowing into the mines in relation to snow melt pulses and the input signals. Um, and note here that this is zinc over 100 and this is manganese over 100 as well, so talking about high concentrations. Um, just to put, give an idea, we sampled a number of other mine sh pools um, in different shafts and portals that we could access. And in a uh, few locations we, saw, we found zinc um, concentrations over 2.5 million micrograms per liter. So there are certainly some locations where the concentrations are very high. But how do these pools of water end up at the St. Louis and how are they connected to that is our question. Um, also associated, I showed you on the overview map, there's a big tailings pile associated with this mine. So one logical um, thing to do in the study is to look at this water coming out. This is to be the toe of the tailing slope and there's water seeping out of it. So I dug a trench and put in a flume and an automatic sampler to see, okay, what's going on with this water? Is this water coming out of this tailing seep? Is it coming from the creek? Is it acid mine drainage from mine workings upstream of this? Is it just natural groundwater flow? And what we found out is that it's, there, is, there is some loading probably to the creek um, from this location, but if you look at the concentrations, they're pretty low of metals associated with the AMD. So for the most part, even though it doesn't look like great water coming out of the tailing seep, you can say that it's probably localized regional groundwater moving through it as opposed to acid mine drainage water from further in the mountain coming through. So it's not necessarily a significant um, point source that we need to focus on at this point. Uh, and just for reference, discharge is about 10 um, GPM. So now uh, we're moving into, well, how can we figure out the sources of the water that moves in through these mines? And one of the areas that I work in, uh, which I don't have time to explain today, but I'm happy to chat with people, is using water isotopes as tracers. And what I've plotted here is deuterium and O18 concentrations. Deuterium is um, an isotope of hydrogen, and O18 is an isotope of oxygen found in water molecules. We can look at water molecules and tell where they come from. What I've plotted on here is this is where snow plots, this is where mine uh, rainwater plots every year um, in these locations. And then I can look at the water at any different location, either within the, at the tunnel outlet, within the shafts, and get an idea of how that water relates to the possible input, right? The water into a watershed is either going to come in as rain or snow. Um, and what we see here is that the surface waters and mine waters are a mixture of rain and snow pretty consistently, and they fall in the local meteoric water line of 7.8 plus 8, which is very close to the global average, which just, if, if you're interested, all it means is that our precip is not strange here. Um, when you look more closely, uh, 
at these water isotopes within the different sources, I can actually tell a little bit more story. And so, what things I want to point out on here, we don't need to go to specifics. These X's are all from the St. Louis Tunnel, but at different months of the year. What we see here is they're all clustered. So that tells me the water coming out of the St. Louis Tunnel is a well-mixed source. It doesn't change seasonally. So it's a, coming from a larger groundwater reservoir that's a mixture of this rain and snow. Whereas these diamonds, the red and the blue, that's Silver Creek. Silver Creek changes seasonally because in the spring, you have melt, snow melt water coming out. Later on in the year, it's groundwater and, and rainwater sources. Um, and other things uh, I can tell from the mine waters that I sampled in October are more depleted, suggesting that the groundwater base flow in October through the mines originated as snow melt because it looks more like snow melt water as opposed to, say, your monsoon rains. Um, Another thing that we like to look at is tritium, which is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, also found in the water molecule, not harmful to you, um, but traceable. And we use this for dating groundwater. Uh, and what we can do here is, all you need to know is these are all different locations. I sampled it. The concentrations are fairly similar across there. Um, and what I can tell from this in the quick and simple is that all of our water sources above and below ground are relatively new water because they look similar to local precipitation in their tritium concentrations. Um, if we saw some of these locations with very high tritium values, say 20 or 40, then we would say that that might be from bomb spike water, which would mean the groundwater is in the ages of 20 to 40 years old. Or if the source had zero tritium, it could be very old groundwater pre-atmospheric uh, nuclear weapons testing, and we get an idea. So take home message from this, due to time, is that um, most of our groundwater source in this system is relatively young water. So the water moving through the ground, we're not talking about tapping into aquifers with thousands of year old water, which is the case in other mining situations. Uh, one project in Creed, we do have sources of water that are in the thousands of years. So that gives us an idea of the turnover through this system. Um, so for stream tracing in Silver Creek, um, sorry, I'm running over time, aren't I? Yep. Uh, so Silver Creek stream tracing, what we did is we wanted to evaluate whether or not that stream crossing the mines is going into the, wa the water from that stream, is it going into the mines? Is that the contributing source to water traveling through the mines, picking up the metals? And so we did this, I'm going to, real quickly, we just used three methods where we measured stream discharge through stage discharge relationships and using time series. We also did slug additions um, using a tracer of sodium chloride, and we also did continuous tracer tests using bromide and a, um, a dye known as rhodamine. And this is, a lot of this work uh, was pretty much uh, designed by Rob Runkel of the USGS. And this is uh, our famous Chris Peltz mixing up our constant injection uh, solution along with Rob. And this is uh, two interns from last summer, Skyler, who I believe is here, um, and Teddy, who uh, came out and helped us on this project. Um, once again, we sample all along the creek. Um, and we also take discharge measurements above and below. So measure the flow above and below the mine adits and see if there's a difference. Um, here's Chris again in a delightfully wonderful weather day, taking stream discharge. He can attest to how difficult it is to do this. Take home here is that our flow measurements um, show that there's no major losses, maybe a little bit of gains. So let's go to another method. Let's look at our slug results. All you need to know here is that distance downstream, um, these lines are different slug tests on different dates, and they're showing the relative flows at these locations downstream, suggesting a loss in flow, a small loss in flow over this reach. Uh, we also did a continuous tracer test. Same thing, this is distance downstream. Remember the added is right here. So as you cross this area, we are seeing some stream losses. So we know the water, the streams are losing a little bit of water, but not a huge amount. And um, when we put those tracers in, I also went underground of the mines. I said, well, are these tracers showing up? So the water that we see lost doesn't show up somewhere else. Well, we didn't find any significant contributions from the tracer in the creek in either of the shafts in the mine or in the tailings pile. So we can't conclude that there's significant water contributions from the creek. 
Um, so within the mine, uh, we want to look at the flow paths of the water moving to the St. Louis Tunnel. Uh, what we have here is this is the top of the 517 shaft. This is where it goes down 500 feet to water, which is at the St. Louis level flowing out to the Dolores. Um, and so what did we do? Um, I made a 50 gallon slug of lithium and fluorescein, so two different types of tracers, um, which I want, one's a fluorescent dye, an organic compound, and the other one's an organic salt, so both natural and non-detrimental to the system. Um, mixed them in a slug, put the slug, siphoned it out of these buckets down 500 feet, then brought in a pipe and pumped 50,000 gallons of water to chase the slug down the shaft and waited for it to show up at the St. Louis. And what we found is very nice breakthrough curves of our fluorescein and our lithium, and in a very rapid amount of time. And it only took about 15 hours for this dye to show up 8,000 feet away at the St. Louis tunnel. Um, and here's what it looks like at the end. So when you mix 30 pounds of powder, you can turn 15 ponds ecto-cooler green for over a week. Um, I overestimated the, you wanted to make sure you have enough concentration of this, not knowing how big the pool of water I'm mixing into is underground. But this uh, showed up the next day, so basically it tells us that that pathway on the maps is relatively clear and free flowing. Um, and then here's a picture of another MSI employee, Emily, taking samples from us. Um, I have to give them a lot of credit. We collected almost 600 water samples in five days which was a pretty big collaborative effort. We did another trace in, inside the Blaine workings. This is Alan Sorensen from the DRMS, where I used a different tracer, which was a five pound slug of fluoride, mixed it into a uh, five gallon bucket and poured it into a pool of mine water that drains to another area, to the shaft, and then went down to that shaft and um, sampled it. Well, that's no problem except for the shaft is 500 feet deep, and I gotta get the sample out every hour. So we built an electronic reel with a baler system, and we ran this reel up and down, and some of the DRM uh, staff who are here today can attest to spending a 24-hour period where we stayed underground and collected these samples to see if this tracer showed up. And yes, it did. So here is our concentrations of fluoride showing up time after the injection at one side in the other location. So similar story, I got a 10 hour ar first arrival so I can generate some velocity and concentrations movement. All right, stop. Conclusions, last slide. Um, so take home message is that there is possible loss from the creek, but it's pretty uh, small percent. And we were not able to identify that water in the mine. The mine connections are open, so the maps that we saw were telling the truth and that those adits and those pathways haven't collapsed. Um, and we have pretty short residence times of the water, as I talked about with isotopes. Um, and basically what we can take away is that that St. Louis tunnel discharging 800 gallons a minute, I think that it could only be maybe 100 or 200 GPM of that is actually your AMD water. And the rest of it is clean groundwater that comes in over that 8,000 foot stretch of tunnel. So the idea being next step is, can we isolate the smaller amount of water and treat that, which is, a, from a cost perspective, is much more reasonable than treating eight, 900 gallons a minute at the bottom if three quarters of it is actually clean regional groundwater. And if anybody finds my rubber ducky in the Dolores River, it did go down the shaft, but it hasn't showed up yet. So. Thanks.